All right. Looks like we are streaming now. So without further ado, we're going to get going. I'm uh, convening this meeting of the Boston City Council's Ways and Means Committee. My name is Kenzie Bach. I'm the District 8 City Councilor for the record and also the chair of the Boston City Council's Committee on Ways and Means. Um, this public hearing is being recorded and live streamed at boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. It will be rebroadcast on Comcast Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Verizon Channel 1964. Um, we're in the midst of a council budget review that will encompass about 27 hearings over roughly six weeks. I think we're in the fifth week of that now. Um, and we strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. Um, so you can do that by joining a hearing like this. Um, and there's a Zoom link on the electronic public notice. You can wait till the end of the hearing and we'll take your public testimony. You can also come to one of our two remaining dedicated public testimony hearings, May 26th at 6 p.m. focused on the VPS budget or May 28th at 6 p.m. focused on all other aspects of the city budget. Um, or you can email the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov or fill out a form on our website, boston.gov slash council dash FY21 budget. There's also a place there to upload a two minute video of your testimony if you'd like. And if you testify written or spoken in any language, we'll commit to getting that translated for the benefit of the council. You can also informally tweet us your questions using the hashtag boss budget. That's BOS budget. So today's hearing is on docket 0588 to 0590, orders for the FY21 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, for the school department and for other post-employment benefits. Docket 0591 to 0592, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations. And docket 0593 to 0596, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Um, those dockets collectively make up the whole FY21 proposed budget from the mayor. Um, but our focus area today will be on the Boston Public Health Commission, um, which is a um, quasi-independent branch of the city, um, but still funded through our city budget, um, and which obviously has been completely essential um, and instrumental to our COVID-19 response, which we are in the middle of right now. Um, so we're it's always important for us to um, gather with them at budget season and talk about uh, their needs and priorities, but never more so than today. Um, so we're very grateful to them. This uh, hearing was long delayed by hearings prior to it earlier in the day. So we're grateful to the team here um, for having waited so long and being ready to speak with the council. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Rita Nieves, who is the interim executive director for the Boston Public Health Commission um, and allow her to introduce her team. Rita, thanks so much. Rita, you're muted. Just make sure you unmute. Um, so I see we're, we're working on sharing a presentation. I don't know if Rita, if Rita is going to speak to this, then her microphone needs to be unmuted. It's still muted. Um, if someone else is going to speak to it, please pipe up. Okay. It's great now, right? Looks great. Okay. Perfect. So good afternoon and thank you, uh, Chairwoman Buck for the opportunity to present, um, today. Um, I'm accompanied with uh, uh, Grace Connolly, who's our Director of Administration and Finance. Um, she's standing by um, more than six feet away from me uh, with her face covering on and uh, lots of plexiglass around us, if you're wondering, uh, in case uh, there's some budget questions that we want uh, her to answer. Um, my name is Rita Nieves. I'm the uh, Interim Executive Director here at the Boston Public Health Commission. And um, for those of you who, who don't know me or haven't met in, in person, I've been here about uh, 26 years in the Boston Public Health Commission and uh, with, in various roles, um, uh, including uh, I was the Bureau Director for the Substance Abuse um, uh, and Recovery Services uh, Bureau for about 14 years. And after that, I spent about three years as a uh, Deputy Director and now in the role of uh, Interim Executive Director, uh, which I started in December, right on time to be ready for the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm um, happy to be here. And um, I, like I said, I've had, the I've had the pleasure to meet some of you um, over the years and work closely with you. And I'm looking forward to, to meeting some of the, the new counselors and, and have a chance to meet and uh, introduce the work of the commission um, when, when we're allowed to meet uh, at some point in the future. 
Um, you know, this is an unprecedented time uh, for public health in the city of Boston. Um, it's a privilege for me to be here today to share the, the vital, important work that we're carry, carrying out across the commission. As you can imagine, the global COVID-19 pandemic has changed our work dramatically and has had a tremendous impact on our residents and has disproportionately affected communities of color and other at high risk groups in our city. Across the commission, our talented staff have been working 24 seven to protect the health of Boston residents, combating the spread of the infection, providing support to our healthcare and community partners and creatively adapting assisting programming to continue to serve community needs in a time of social distancing. We continue to, ad to adjust our efforts as we learn more about the impact of this devastating disease. I'd like to start by giving a brief overview of the commission. Then we'll present key accomplishments for uh, FY20 through the emergency management lens of uh, preparedness, response, and recovery. Um, I forgot to add that when I'm done uh, presenting, we're gonna have our, our, uh, our colleague, uh, Jen Tracy present uh, on recovery services. And I understand then the idea is that we both take questions um, after both get a chance to, to present. So a little, a little bit of background, uh, again, for those of you who are not as familiar with the, uh, the work of the Boston Public Health Commission. Um, you know, we're the nation's first health department. We trace our roots back to 1799, when Paul Revere was named Boston's uh, first health officer. Back then, the Board of Health uh, was formed to fight a potential outbreak of cholera. During that outbreak, the Board of Health implemented innovative strategies to save lives by posting signs on lampposts, held community meetings, and led an early day public information campaign to reduce deaths due to cholera, which was a highly preventable uh, disease. 221 years later, that, that tradition of, of prevention continues through the Boston Public Health Commission, and we find ourselves uh, responding to the first pandemic that we've had in this country for over more than uh, 100 years. Well we're, the, well, we're the country's oldest health department. We pride ourselves on having some of the most innovative and new services for our residents. Public service and access to quality health care are the cornerstones of, of our mission to protect, preserve, and promote the health and well being of all Boston residents, particularly those who are most vulnerable. Um, our vision, uh, or I should say, we envision as an agency. Uh, a thriving Boston where all residents live healthy, fulfilling, fulfilling lives, free of racism, poverty, violence, and other systems of oppression. All residents will have equitable opportunities, or opportunities and resources leading to optimal health and well being. Even at this time of uncertainty, we continue to be guided by our 2019 to 2021 strategic plan we recently completed and um, in, that includes four priorities, um, racial justice and health equity, workforce development or informatics and data and uh, establishing collaborative partnerships. The commission is governed by seven boards of health appointed by May Mayor Walsh. We're made of six bureaus, have a workforce of about 1100 persons and manage over 40 individual programs driven by our mission, and that mission grounds us in racial justice and health equity. Earlier today, um, you heard Chief Hooley testified on Boston and EMS. And like I said, after my presentation, Jim Tracy will, will cover uh, the work that happens under the recovery services bucket. Um, this afternoon, I'm gonna concentrate on, on talking about the, the other four bureaus, which are the child, adolescent, and family health, community initiatives, homeless services, and infectious diseases. I would like to highlight some of the work we performed in the first half of um, fiscal year 20, before there was a glimmer of COVID-19 and consistent with our goals to build healthy, resilient communities and systemic equity. Here are a few accomplishments from our bureaus over the past um, fiscal year. The uh, Community Initiative Bureau rapidly implemented the new Board of Health and State Regulations on, on vaping, vaping and favored tobacco protecting our youth and particularly youth of color. Our Child Adolescent uh, and Family Health Bureau provided over 900 families with home visiting services 
and links to resources to each healthy baby child program. Homeless Services Bureau permanently placed 351 individuals outside of shelter, and that was a 20% increase from this time last year. And our Infectious Disease Bureau um, worked to reduce the impact of other infectious diseases, prevent sickness associated with these diseases, and create healthier lives for everyone in the city. We want to um, highlight that even before the pandemic, the Infectious Disease Bureau investigated thousands of disease reports um, per year. During FY20, or the beginning of it, the Bureau investigated 11,824 non-COVID infectious disease reports and managed about 1,410 contacts associated with non-COVID-9 conditions. In the current crisis, our existing infectious disease tracking infrastructure, along with the deep knowledge and experience of our public health nurses, has proven invaluable. Even during the COVID-19 response, our team has had to continue to investigate and do contact tracing for other communicable diseases that go on and continue to, to happen in our city. Lastly, I would like to um, highlight uh, a very important uh, and critical function within the Boston Public Health Commission, and that is the Office of Public Health Preparedness. This office works to enhance community, public health, and healthcare system resiliency in order to prepare for, respond to, and recover for, from emergencies that impact health and access to healthcare. In the current crisis, we have the office's uh, assisted infrastructure to draw on, uh, are in, in, including our medical research corps, the tight relationships that, that we have built over the years with healthcare partners through emergency planning and tabletop exercises, and staff who have been trained and ready to respond to disasters and healthcare crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a, a, a quick uh, Boston timeline with some highlights of what's been going on since um, January. Um, we started uh, our public health uh, preparedness and response to COVID-19 uh, you know, mid-January of 2020. We activated our incident command to guide our public health response and late January uh, declared public health emergency uh, on Sunday, March 15. In reality, we started pre preparing for this year um, years ago, uh, the commission through our Office of Public Health Preparedness has led our responses to H1N1, the Boston Marathon, extreme weather and other emergencies that we've had to uh, face over the years. This office maintains an ongoing communication system with all Boston hospitals, health centers, and long-term long care facilities so that when we need to scale up and respond to an emergency, their position uh, to do so. And this was the case, obviously, with the need to respond to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I want to um, give you uh, a, a few uh, updates uh, in using the, the objectives that we developed for our uh, commission COVID-19 response plan to give you uh, an idea of some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, and again, it's just an idea uh, because in the interest of time, I couldn't possibly cover all the work that that we've done on their response. So um, the first objective of their plan has to do with um, managing uh, the Boston Public Health Commission's uh, COVID-19 response. And, um, you know, and, and this has to do with um, providing day-to-day -day direction and leadership in the city around the, the response, including streamlining decision-making and planning for preparedness response, and obviously uh, recovery stages um, going forward. So um, one of the things that we did, as I mentioned before, we stood up the incident command structure that has uh, helped us stay organized, focus, and be very deliberate in, in everything that we've had to do in the last three months. Um, we've also, um, our Office of uh, Public Health Preparedness uh, and our MIG manager and a couple of our senior leaders uh, joined and participate in the daily calls with the mayor and other city partners and city leadership to provide situational awareness um, and describe the epidemiology of the disease, any emergent issues that we're seeing, and provide advice during preparedness response and recovery, and more importantly, reopening um, when the moment comes. 
Our second objective has to do with uh, maintaining situational awareness for internal and external partners. And um, we do that by gathering and sharing information on a daily basis related to our emergency response and new COVID related developments to key partners. Um, so we uh, have participated in numerous um, city calls with numerous uh, stakeholders, including um, universities, healthcare partners, uh, community health centers, restaurants, the faith based community, transportation, small businesses. Uh, to answer questions and provide a public health perspective in the context of uh, reopening uh, planning. And we have provided countless uh, clinical infection control guidance to partners and staff as the situation uh, has, has progressed. We've also done um, multiple webinars for community partners, bringing information uh, to, to folks. And we have um, the mayor's health line, uh, which has answered thousands of calls for residents and partners about services and resources related to, to COVID-19. Our fourth uh, objective under our response plan has to do with sharing information with residents uh, of Boston and provide accurate and up-to-date information about COVID-19. So well, we have uh, disseminated information to residents to ensure how that they know what they should be doing to, uh, and, and also that battling misinformation and rumors. Uh, we have developed numerous educational materi materials, FAQs and guidelines. And we also maintain a website at bpac.org with updated daily information to reflect uh, developments. Um, you know, and, and we've always, you know, our intention is to seek to provide information that is clear, that is actionable, and linguistically and culturally competent um, um, for, for our residents. We publish our materials in um, 10 languages, and that's our current practice. Our fifth objective has to do with uh, stopping the, the spread of COVID-19. And um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the commission worked to increase the contract tracing team from its original team of 15 full-time public health nurses to between 40 and 50 uh, uh, individuals today. Uh, these nurses trace and monitor contacts of infected people. They support the quarantine of contacts and they provide linguistically and culturally competent resources to contacts. Um, you know, the, the ability to perform this, this vital function uh, has been, you know, um, obviously instrumental and key to our, our response efforts. Um, the commission, um, you know, uh, like I said, you know, worked uh, very uh, quickly to increase our capacity to be able to do this. We're actually uh, collaborating with the State Department of Public Health. Uh, we're the contract tracing uh, collaborative. And through that collaborative, we've been able to enhance um, our ability to continue to keep up with contact tracing. Um, as you know, the state has assigned a number of contact tracers to join our efforts and be able to help us um, uh, keep up with all the contact tracing we, we have to do. The sixth objective has to do with uh, coordinating resources with healthcare partners and others. Uh, and health uh, uh, commission programs get the resources they need to support guests, clients, and staff. So since March 1st, uh, we've had 150 unique medical research course volunteers that have supported 196 shifts, uh, equally uh, 1,670 hours to support the COVID-19 response efforts. Um, we, we've also, uh, through the MIC, we've also worked to fulfill resources requests from healthcare partners and other organizations. As of May 18, we have provided over 900,000 requested items to, to partners. This includes over 300,000 pairs of gloves, uh, 22,000 face shields and over 70,000 gowns. Um, in order to maximize our resources, we also have adapted assistant programming. Staff uh, are being redeployed to support our COVID uh, work. For example, some of our um, environmental health inspectors in the Community Initiative Bureau are now members of what we call the Disease Containment Strike Team. And under the direction of the MIG, uh, this multidisciplinary cross-agency uh, team 
targets congregate settings with the potential for rapid spread of infection. Uh, this is a picture of one of our inspectors um, who've been redeployed to do this kind of work. And, um, you know, protecting vulnerable populations is part of uh, the objective that I just mentioned. So um, keeping our health centers and long-term care facilities resource and safe was one of our goals. So we have fulfilled a number of uh, critical resources needs that they've had. This is a, a table that's showing um, uh, materials and supplies that we've been able to share with, with, with our partners. Thank you. And, you know, protecting vulnerable populations, um, again, another uh, strategy uh, under the, uh, the objective that I just mentioned. So, um, and one of them was keeping our shelter safe uh, by, uh, implement, you know, identifying and setting up alternative care sites for um, our homeless individuals. The, the densification of shelters by placing some of our guests in, in dorms and places where they could be in individual rooms and, and don't have to share and be comfortable, keeping our doors open to both new guests and returning uh, guests, uh, implementing safety protocols for staff uh, in our shelters, and universal COVID-19 testing for all unhoused individuals in Boston. We were able to uh, implement a comprehensive testing plan to track, trace, and isolate um, those that were uh, found to be positive. Uh, to date, a total of 2,290 homeless individuals have been tested for COVID uh, since March 12th, and 32.4% uh, uh, of them uh, were positive, and we're we were able to uh, um, isolate them in proper uh, sites with the, um, all the alternative sites that we were able to create in the city. Yes. Um, also protecting our commission's workforce is, 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 was a key objective uh, within our plan. So we've, um, we've reshaped BPAC for social distancing to protect staff, ensure we can continue to serve Boston residents. We implemented a, a telework policy, revised our sick leave policy. We ensure that we have PPE for our frontline staff. We develop monitoring stations at every facility where everybody has to be screened before they come in. Um, we instituted a safety officer physician, which is a person who goes to all of our facilities and ensures that people are following the rules. And uh, we've also were able to accommodate, um, provide accommodations for frontline staff uh, if they got sick or they needed to quarantine themselves away from their families, uh, along with other um, uh, first responders, they were able to benefit from going to Northeastern uh, dorms and Hotel Boston, where uh, some of our folks were able to, to uh, enjoy, you know, uh, you know, being away from, from their families while they need to either quarantine or isolate. Uh, our next objective had to do with meeting uh, human services needs. So, um, you know, we obviously recognize the burden that COVID-19 is placing on individuals, ranging from uh, job loss to emergency child care needs to mental health challenges related to isolation and fear. So uh, we've helped and coordinate and monitor needs to, fo to fall outside the scope of health care needs uh, that we traditionally do. And for example, we're providing, you know, virtual services for pregnant women um, through our Healthy Baby, Healthy Child um, program. Um, so we're able to offer uh, services via phone, text, FaceTime, or Skype. And depending on the, on the client's technology access, you know, we're able to provide these services in six languages. And lastly, you know, our last objective has to do with recovery planning. I uh, just want to highlight that, you know, the difference between um, uh, reopening and, and recovery. Reopening is about losing the restrictions of movement and in-person operations. Recovery from COVID-19 will require strategies and processes to strengthen and rebuild the health of Boston. Uh, the BPHC is not yet in recovery phase, but it's important to begin planning for an equitable recovery for all Bostonians. 
were helping to help uh, develop a COVID-19 to your Boston disaster recovery framework to guide our planning and ensure that recovery is effective, efficient, and equitable. Uh, COVID-19 is a public health crisis that is in, in impacting every single neighborhood and community in our city. But we know that some populations are disproportionately impacted um, and the pandemic, the pandemic has reinforced the need to continue to prioritize social determinants of health and racial and, and social inequities. Um, aiding in, in this, this effort uh, to address inequities is the Health Equity Task Force, task force uh, that was established by Mayor Walsh to provide recommendations and resources to ensure uh, greater equity in, in data collection, uh, uh, additional access um, and increased access to testing sites and healthcare services for Black, uh, Latinx, Asian, and immigrant uh, residents. And um, our long-term goal, obviously, will be to restore and enhance um, the, the health and well-being of our residents and city by building new systems that eliminate inequities and strengthen our ability to respond to future uh, disasters. I'd like to, um, to close by acknowledging the suffering and loss of life that Boston has experienced throughout this outbreak. The impact on our communities, our partners, and our staff has been uh, devastating, but we're looking ahead with hope and resolve towards FY21, ready to continue to carry out the vital work for of the work of public health um, in the intention of not going back to normal, but bouncing forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rita. Um, and uh, thank you for that um, thorough presentation and um, all those details that I know will also be um, helpful for the public watching this at home. Um, before we go to counselor questions, um, I'm actually gonna ask um, Jen Tracy, who's also with us from Rita's team to present her Office of Recovery Services slide deck, because I think it will be more efficient for us to ask questions of both uh, related to both decks. Um, but before I go to Jen, I just want to acknowledge my council colleagues who are here. Um, this will also be our order when we go to questions. I'll put it in the chat. But Councillor Asabi George at large, Councillor Matt O'Malley, District 6, Councillor Liz Breeden, District 9, Councillor Andrea Campbell, District 4, Councillor Kim Janey, District 7 and Council President, Councillor Michael Flaherty at large, Councillor Frank Baker, District 3, Councillor Ricardo Arroyo, District 5, Councillor Julia Mejia at large and Councillor Ed Flynn, District 2. Um, so thank you to all the colleagues who are here. Um, you know, I think obviously this is a really important set of topics. And uh, so I'd like to offer Jen the chance to present now. Jen, okay, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, all set? All set, we can see it and we can hear you. Okay, great, thanks guys. All right, good, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman Bach and- uh, That's generous, good evening. <laughs> good evening, um, and counselors. Uh, we're grateful to be here with you all today. Since I was, uh, before you last year, we have continued to expand the scope of our efforts and have worked to meet the needs of our most vulnerable constituents. I'm joined by my colleague, Devin Larkin, over here to my left, Director of the Bureau of Recovery Services. This year, with Mayor Walsh's commitment and the Health and Human Services Chief Marty Martinez, Rita Nieves, along with City Council support, we've strategically combined and elevated our collective efforts, joining the HHS Cabinet to maximize impact and efficiency. Thanks to Mayor Walsh's leadership and the City Council support, our budgets have steadily increased since our creation. We've almost doubled the city's response through city funding, and we are aggressively focusing on third-party billing, state and federal grants. We offer a full continuum of care from harm reduction to recovery supports, focusing on each step of the recovery continuum. Our outreach teams cover the Mass Cast neighborhood, which stretches from Nubian Square to Andrew Square to the South End. And in addition, we provide outreach downtown and across the city in high use neighborhoods. This includes mobile services through the Care Zone van, the Mobile Sharps team that responds to 311 calls uh, for syringe pickup. The Engagement Center is a low threshold drop-in space 
for individuals experiencing homelessness and substance use disorder, providing a safe uh, space to spend time during the day. Our AHOPE program provides comprehensive drug user health, providing HIV, STI testing, harm reduction supplies, and Narcan. Assisting people in navigating access to care is a cornerstone of what we do. PATHS is a drop-in navigation center, open seven days a week, placing people in treatment all over the state. The team also manages 311 calls for recovery support. And our Mattapan campus, which has three residential treatment programs serving high-risk populations, men returning from the justice system, bilingual, bicultural women and their children, and a co-ed program that serves individuals from the street or following detox. So the next uh, few slides represent some of our metrics and indicate the volume and impact of the work at the city level as we continue to respond to the devastating toll of the drug epidemic. As I mentioned, PATHS is open seven days a week and provides triage to treatment. This year, the program has placed over 3,000 people in treatment facilities all over the state including transportation. There is still a strong demand for services despite COVID-19, and PAS has placed an average of 77 people per week in treatment since the shelter-in-place advisory compared to 87 people uh, the week before. Urban centers all over the country are grappling with quality of life challenges. We have increased the way we collect improperly disposed syringes, requiring all staff across programs to join the effort. The main ways we collect syringes are through participants in our programs, outreach in the mobile sharps team, and neighborhood kiosks. 74% of syringe returns are from clients um, at our AHOPE harm reduction program, 14% from mobile sharps, 12% from kiosks. We are thankful for Councilwoman Asabi George's leadership on this issue as well. The engagement center located behind the 112 Southampton shelter, averages about 72 people at any given time throughout the day. And this fluctuates from the maximum capacity of 120 individuals to a minimum of 40 to 50 throughout the day. There's a clinic inside the engagement center run by Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, which provides much needed medical care to participants. We've experienced an increase in the need for services for drug users and are working with other communities and cities and towns to scale up their efforts to provide much needed harm reduction services. Naloxone distribution is up approximately 10% compared to last year. We have distributed almost 18,000 doses of Narcan. We distribute Narcan and information in many ways. Uh, so far in FY20, we've provided 208 overdose prevention trainings to 6,711 people and have given out uh, 17,820 doses of Narcan. We do this through street outreach, mobile services, overdose prevention trainings, and other initiatives. For example, this year we implemented a new initiative where we equipped all city buildings with Narcan kits. Fatal overdoses continue to happen behind closed doors and in people's homes. The city's post-overdose response team is a partnership between recovery services and first responders. With Boston Fire Department taking a lead role with us along with EMS um, and Chief Cooley's team. The intervention provides outreach, Narcan, and connections to services following a non-fatal overdose that occurs in a residence. The team conducted 300 visits pre-COVID and engaged with 95 individuals and family members. Um, so this year, um, right before COVID, we launched our youth campaign, the COPE Code campaign. It's a campaign developed by youth, which focuses on normalizing feelings of stress and helping youth develop positive coping skills. The campaign meets youth where they're at by engaging youth service organizations um, to deliver the campaign. We also build capacity with our prevention team in youth systems by focusing on youth engagement, comprehensive health, uh, uh, health education, and technical assistance and training. Our prevention team facilitated workshops with youth directly about substance use, marijuana, and harm reduction. They developed marijuana education lessons, working closely with our partners at BPS. 
Uh, the team has provided trainings to youth serving agencies on substance use, marijuana, and engaging youth in conversations around substance use. Our youth prevention efforts address critical needs to support our young people, um, particularly now. In October, uh, we launched the MassCast 2.0 strategic plan with over 12 city departments. The plan focuses on four main buckets, public health, public safety, quality of life and communication. Under public health, we doubled the size of our recovery services street outreach team um, and EMS under Chief Cooley's leadership expanded the squad AD coverage. Under public safety, the Boston Police Department street outreach unit was expanded. And under quality of life, Department of Public Works expanded their cleaning coverage and added a team of four uh, to the neighborhood. Under communication, we launched uh, a task force of community stakeholders and are finalizing a public dashboard with information and metrics for the neighborhood. We, we continue the goal of a comprehensive recovery campus on Long Island. We are working with consultants along with a team of city departments and stakeholders to develop a master plan and focus on the service model, which provides long, focusing on uh, long-term treatment, employment skills, wellness, wraparound services um, uh, to help people to maintain long-term recovery. As we um, all are aware, COVID-19 has had a direct impact on our clients and our staff. We have remained open and operational throughout the pandemic making significant program modifications, including social distancing and expanded space to reduce transmission of risk, including delivering our AHOPE harm reduction services completely outdoors and shifting all behavioral health outpatient services to telehealth. The engagement center has reduced inside space and expanded the outside space to promote social distancing. They have in been instrumental in assisting with COVID-19 screenings, um, and ac increasing access to hand washing, um, social distancing, and, and bathroom use. We have implemented additional screening, testing, and infection control measures at our residential programs on the Mattapan campus. And the MassCast Street Outreach Team uh, has been redeployed at times to support the engagement center as we manage staff absences due to isolation and quarantine. As staff recover, the team is out on the street again, thankfully. Adjustments have also required new initiatives. We have launched comfort stations in the MassCast neighborhood. These stations provide people spending time on the street with a safe place to go, to use the bathroom, wash their hands, um, and connect with care. The city's resiliency fund, in partnership with the RISE Foundation, has helped support community-based residential treatment providers across Boston as they respond uh, to needs from COVID-19. So many of the uh, residential community-based re residential programs across the city um, had increased costs uh, due to COVID, increased cleaning costs, increased technology costs, um, and uh, we were able to provide some support for that. Our direct service staff um, also supported the Boston Hope um, Hospital at the BCEC. And the youth prevention campaign has moved to a virtual campaign that is supporting young people at home during COVID times. Looking ahead, we will continue with the following goals. Uh, expanding harm reduction across all communities, increasing access to care, and promoting youth prevention. We are grateful that the FY21 budget includes a new initiative to study the implementation of an overnight respite, targeting on-street population with substance use disorder and homelessness. This week, we have started expanding the AHOPE drop-in space to include space for women-specific programming. We will continue the work with Public Facilities Department to design and build a permanent engagement center, increasing options for access to care. And the Long Island Recovery Campus Master Planning continues focusing on expanding access to care for the region. Youth prevention remains a priority and we will focus new initiatives providing community grants and new ways to virtually support our young people. Before we take questions, uh, we wanted to use this opportunity to thank all of our staff that are on the front lines of the pandemic and show up every day. Thank you uh, for your support and we can uh, look forward to continuing to work with all of you um, in the year ahead. 
Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jen and Rita, for both those presentations. Um, and I'm especially glad that uh, that we were able to also get the presentation on recovery services, because I think we all know that that work continues to be really central and can't can't be uh, can't be overshadowed by the current pandemic. Um, so without further ado, we'll jump into questions, turning first to Councillor Asabi George, then it'll be Councillor O'Malley. Folks can see the order in the chat. Councillor Asabi George. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just, just for your own um, information, I will likely use two rounds of questions today. Uh, thank you to Rita and Jen and both of your respective teams for the work that you do every single day, uh, especially during this time. I know as you work to outreach to some of our more vulnerable uh, residents that the that the work is especially difficult. I also want to give special thanks to the Mobile Sharps team um, for the work that they're doing both in uh, collecting improperly discarded sharps across our city, but also in the um, direct outreach that they are, they're doing every day to make sure that our residents have access to the things they need to be well or to be better and hopefully to access some recovery. And then also uh, your shelter providers, both at Southampton Street and Woods Mellon, we know that the work, especially today, is, is difficult, um, as it is every day, but in particular these days. And I, in light of that, I wonder with sort of the, the shifting needs um, of our residents, especially those experiencing homelessness, are we, do we see um, in our budget um, an added cost associated with what will likely be an increase in the need for PPE and other sort of protective and, um, equipment, and then also the additional cleaning. Do we see an increase in, in the fiscal year FY21 budget for next year? And um, if you can also maybe mention uh, as it relates to COVID-19 and the pandemic, the work that you are doing in your, uh, whether it's Office of Recovery Services or through the, the Health Commission, the guidance that you're providing to other city departments, um, not just to respond to this current crisis, but being better prepared uh, for future crisis or a, um, a second surge or second sort of leg of this pandemic. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you too to Chief Martinez, who's um, with us this, this after this. What time of day is it? Let's see what for now. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I will have further questions for future rounds. Um, yes, I do want to welcome Chief Marty Martinez, who's joined us, who's really been leading the city's uh, response to the pandemic on the public health side. I know that Rita and Jen and others on his staff will be, you know, taking the questions and managing this hearing, but we're grateful for his presence here. Uh, Chief Martinez, if you want to just say hello so folks watching at home can see you. Yeah, no, no, thank, thank you, Councillor, and uh, thank you. I'm just happy to be able to be here with these, uh, these great leaders of, these, uh, of this work, so I'm just here to support them, so thank you for that. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks so much. And Councillor Sabi George, I'll credit that time back to your account. Um, uh, Rita and uh, Jen, do you guys have any answers to the questions the Councillor asked? Um, you're both muted, just so you know. <laughs> we need to slightly improve the, the mechanics here on this front. Or I see Jen's unmuted. I'm muted on the Hi, Jen. I'm Devin. Oh, hi, oh. Devin. I see you over there. Hi, Devin. <laughs> so, um, uh, let me let me speak about the 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 budget question that uh, Councillor um, Tavi George uh, put forward. So, so this is how we're, we're approaching the the budget situation. Um, clearly, we've had um, some extra cost, you know, since since this all started. And, um, um, you know, for, for FY20, I mean, our plans are to uh, rely on FEMA dollars um, and also some CARES Act dollars that have been allocated for, for um, the public health response. And those are dollars that will go, uh, that we can access through December 30th. So the reason why we haven't um, made any changes to the, the FY21 budget that we developed pre-COVID-19, obviously, uh, period, is because we feel that uh, we're doing a couple of things. One, um, you know, we are realigning some of our resources uh, and reimagining, you know, 
how we should be uh, delivering services between now and December, because you know there's so many unknowns. So we're going to assume that we're going to have to stay, you know, you know, a foot in response and another foot, you know, and and get into all the recover, you know, the recovery phase and all the um, levels of that. And um, so by realigning and reimagining how to deliver services going forward, we may be able to save money in some areas, uh, you know, and then use it to, to accommodate uh, some costs that we didn't have planned in the budget. And the last thing is, it has to do again with the CARES Act money. Um, you know, uh, we feel confident that there's enough money there that's going to allow us to um, respond, uh, purchase, um, do all the contracts, buy all the services that we already uh, have an idea that we would need again between now and December to be able to continue to be on a respond mode. And that, that includes, you know, PPE, includes uh, overtime, additional staff, includes um, uh, uh, costs associated with uh, quarantine and isolation, testing supplies, you know, paying uh, folks to help us test, you know, we need to continue to do universal testing, especially in, in our shelters and other uh, and with other vulnerable populations. So, um, so we have already um, planned for for that to be the case, and we're gonna we're uh, counting and using CARES Act money for that. So that's I suppose that's the quickest way to answer that question. Great, thank you for that. Um, and I will I will save. Actually, I'll ask one quick question of Jen around the um, Narcan distribution. We noticed um, we've increased the amount of distribution over a period of time. Are we seeing that that's because it's in more hands or is it because there's more Narcan in one person's hand? So an individual requiring multiple doses of Narcan um, if they're experiencing an overdose. And that will be my last question for this round. Can we answer that? What? Can we answer that? You can. Hi, Nisa. <laughs> um, Hi. I think what we're seeing is that we're just pushing out Narcan in more places. Mm -hmm. um, there's more clients coming in to, for services. We're, we're just doing more Narcan because there's more need coming into our services. We've also increased uh, the areas where we give out Narcan. For example, if Port is still relatively new, we're giving out more Narcan from home visits as we increase that effort. We're giving out yeah. more Narcan. We're leaving um, incarceration and treatment. Um, so it's not so much people need more doses, it's more that we're seeing more people accessing services. Great. That's, and I know that the trainings that um, you host um, across the city are really great for our communities to participate in. I, I imagine they're not happening right now, but they are great. I see the gavel is up. I'll save the rest of my questions for the next round. Thank you all. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Asabi George. Councillor O'Malley, and then it'll be Councillor Braden. Councillor O'Malley? Councillor O'Malley? You there? All right. Uh, we're moving along quickly today, so we'll jump straight to Councillor Braden. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for all of what you're doing. Um, it's been really an amazing process to uh, watch all the great work that, that you folks are doing. And uh, it's also been great to hear from uh, firsthand your response to stepping up to meet the needs of our most vulnerable population in this incredibly difficult time. Got a, a culture of caring and extending uh, uh, your skills and talents to build and coalition building to get, get the job done has been really impressive. Um, I just, in terms of what's coming, like um, this crisis, this COVID crisis is far from over. Um, I, I don't know, are we making contingency plans to stockpile PPE and be ready if there's a second surge so that we can meet that um, head on when it happens? Not when, not if it happens, but when it happens, in my opinion, but um, I just had had you uh, what your contingency plans in terms of budgeting, et cetera, for that. The computer keeps uh, um, uh, muting me for some reason. 
Um, so yes to all the questions. Um, we, um, there, there are so many unknowns, right? About uh, what may happen. Um, well, what may happen when, when we get to, if we follow the, uh, the state's uh, phases for reopening, if, when we get to phase one, phase two, there's so many unknowns. We don't know what's gonna happen. Um, and we don't know if we're gonna quickly see uh, clusters, you know, uh, of cases come up and that's, that's gonna trigger um, um, changes uh, to, to some of the, uh, you know, relaxing of the rules. So we, we are gonna be cautious uh, as far as, you know, everything we control here in Boston, we're gonna be very cautious and we're gonna um, both, we're budgeting uh, to, to be able to have resources so we can have a robust response, uh, ability to respond. And um, that goes to, you know, from, from our testing strategy to make sure we get to test as many people as we can. Um, while we do that, you know, we make sure that we're also uh, capturing those asymptomatic folks that are still there. That could potentially be the folks that, you know, when things reopen a little bit more, begin to, to interact with other folks and then, you know, community transmission will continue and then um, cases will rise. So, uh, you know, there's a uh, testing strategy. There's also uh, making sure that we maintain a level of um, uh, quarantine and isolation beds that will be adequate. Again, uh, because we see clusters and we see a lot of cases, we need to be able to isolate folks and we need to be able to provide quarantine, especially for community residents and, and people in congregate settings um, as well. And then we also need to be, uh, make sure that our hospitals can treat uh, folks that may get sick and may need acute care. So um, the hospitals, you know, we're, we've been so fortunate uh, that we, we have such experience, um, you know, world-class hospitals uh, in Boston that not only are they good at what they do, but they're also good at, at preparedness. They, you know, we have coalitions of in, in a very strong network that communicates constantly. Um, you know, they do mocks of, of this type of scenarios all the time. So um, the reason why we have not seen a, a worse situation in Boston in terms of how, um, you know, uh, hospitals inability to care for folks or lack of uh, ICU beds or lack of ventilators is because of all the planning that has gone into place. So. Uh, hospitals that have this conversation themselves, you know, how do we begin to reopen and serve other type of patients and other open up, uh, you know, outpatient facilities, uh, how do we open our surgical beds, our ORs, uh, but also maintain uh, the ability to escalate as needed. So that's, that's going to be our strategy. Uh, uh, plan for the future, but be ready to escalate as needed. Uh, and as you said, you know, this this is gonna go on for a long time, you know, even if the summer goes well and things, um, you know, don't get out of hand uh, and we don't see cases uh, start to increase rapidly, we don't know what's gonna happen in the fall. So we're gonna to have to like, like really have all these systems in place, ready to push the button, escalate them quickly and have the resources to be able to afford to do that. So that's Thank the plan. Thank you. I, I really do think it's an example of really good teamwork and collaboration. Um, the other question I have, uh, many of our colleges are planning to bring their students back on campus at the end of August. Mm. Um, I'm a little fearful of that, given that we have tens of thousands of those students live in our neighborhood and we have some very vulnerable elders and uh, immigrant and low income populations here that um, you know are more, pro more vulnerable to this disease. Um, they're proposing, the, the colleges are proposing to do their own testing. And I, I hope that they will share that data with you folks and that uh, we will be able to strategize and, and make a plan if there is a, a hotspot that develops um, mm -hmm. uh, from a student population. That's more, of a, that's more of a rhetorical question. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, but uh, that, so to give you some reassurance, uh, both the state, the state uh, has developed a working group to uh, work with the universities and that, so they can develop some guidance. And also, um, you know, uh, the mayor, you know, um, it's, it's leading also a working group with, with local universities. And we held a, a call uh, this week actually with the um, commuter colleges as well. So we're in conversations with all those systems. 
Um, the good news is that they're also feeling very cautious, you know, in asking questions, coming to us, asking for advice, and we're at the table with them. Um, and, uh, you know, things will look differently in different places. You know, there are universities that have lots of resources and lots of capacity, and some of them may be able to do a lot of work um, on campus, you know, with, the, with their infrastructure, and we'll be there to, to guide them and, and support them and, and give them some advice. Other colleges will not have those resources, and, and I would imagine uh, some of those places will tend to not open right away uh, or, or stay online, and, uh, and then maybe open up uh, later, you know, uh, at the beginning of the year. So uh, those conversations are happening, what I, I suspect will happen for the next um, uh, month or, or so, and uh, this, they're, they're, we're not ready to make decisions about that, but uh, the moment will come. And uh, it looks slightly different in different places. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I hear the little dingling, so I have to go. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Breeden. Um, next up, Councillor Campbell, and then it'll be Councillor Janey. Councillor Campbell. Councillor Campbell, you there? All right, again. I'm, I'm yelling, gonna... yes, I am, but you can't hear me because I'm on mute. Hear you if you're yes, I am. Um, so first of all, Rita and Jen, thank you ladies so much. I mean, Jen, I actually thanked you in the last uh, budget hearing for your work um, and your team's work, you know, on the front lines before COVID-19 in the midst of COVID-19. So really appreciate you. And uh, Rita, you know, you've obviously been a dedicated employee and um, at the Health Commission for decades and appreciate you, your team. Chief Martinez, I, I know was on at some point. So thank you to him as well. I know your jobs are not easy. So I'll keep this short um, just so we don't go to another round because I know this hearing is incredibly late and I'd love to also respect Councillor Box time as well. Um, so uh, the first is I, I, most of my, actually I think all my questions are, are directed uh, to you, Rita. Um, and they're more high level versus in the weeds on some of the budget questions I can always email. And I know there were some questions that were sent back and forth to save time here. Um, but obviously you talked about and have been on numerous calls around the inequities with respect to COVID-19 and the health disparities that existed in the communities, but then now of course are exacerbated by this. So I'm curious from uh, your perspective, where do you think we should be making the greatest investments? That's one question. Um, and another is, um, what are the top strategies that you think we need to be investing in to eradicate those health disparities that we've been talking about for so long? And then my last question um, has to do with, this existed before, but now you're really seeing it, how difficult it is for some residents sometimes to navigate the various health systems, the hospital, community health centers, our city, our, you name it, um, and you know the health insurance pieces of it too. Have you guys considered, or has the commission considered investing in what people say are health navigators, um, folks in the community, like a team of folks who are also multilingual, culturally competent, to help uh, residents navigate what can sometimes be very complex uh, processes in order to, to uh, be served? Those are my questions. Thank you, Rita. And Jen, thank you and your team tremendously. Um, I'll, um, I'll try to answer in the order you asked. So in terms of uh, top strategies, I think that um, right now in terms of inequities and in, in terms of some of the uh, conversations we've had with the Health Inequities Task Force, I think we need to continue to concentrate on ensuring that um, we're making testing accessible to folks. Um, we, we have a testing strategy that has to do with, it's really concentrating on getting to uh, provide access to groups that have been disproportionately affected by, by COVID-19, but that we have evidence that um, the testing rates are, are low. And uh, we're also getting to high density areas um, you know, especially buildings and complexes where there's a lot of people that live there. And we also have um, evidence that they're low testing, area, uh, that low testing numbers. And also get into vulnerable uh, groups, you know, in congregate settings, you know, our shelters. Oh, sorry, sorry, Rita. I probably wasn't clear and I apologize because it's been a long day. 
it was really looking past COVID, right? So all of those underlying disparities, yep. what's the top strategies to address those, which continue to be conversations for decades, right? Yep. Um, and then what are, where, where do we make the greatest investments um, to complement those strategies, or maybe it's something different. And this is really looking beyond COVID, which I'm confident, you know, we'll get out of this, right? Yeah. We have many other things. Thank you. Well, I, it, it'll, it may be beyond COVID, but it, it, it needs to start at some point. And, and COVID is giving us the opportunity to have those conversations and, and hopefully um, have some lessons learned and, and really incorporate in our planning how we can, in a more systemic way, start addressing social determinants of health. So one, one thing I would say is that, uh, one thing that has been, that, that the COVID-19 response has, has really uh, facilitated is some cross uh, depart departmental uh, collaborations and communications about the response. You know, uh, I'm sure you've heard that uh, every, every morning at 8 a.m. there's a, a call with the mayor and I don't know, sometimes it's almost a hundred folks, you know, they're all cabinet uh, chiefs and department heads and, and other key leadership. And we're all talking about how to solve problems that are, are emerging. Uh, and those that, that we know have been there because of COVID-19 and, uh, you know, talk, you know, dealing with issues around housing and food access and all those things. So I think one, one strategy going forward is maybe take lessons from, from the work we've been able to do together as, as a larger city government team, because I think it's proven how powerful it can be when we come together um, and, and figure out a way to stop working in silos because that's how, how the federal government, the state government and city government uh, tends to operate. You know, funding is so categorical for the most part we all go into our areas of expertise and content areas with our money and try to make an impact. And we know that in, in order to, to make an impact and, and really uh, achieve some health equity and deal with racial injustices, you know, we're gonna have to figure out a way to, to come together. Um, so I, I wonder, you know, what strategy could be to keep up, you know, figure out a way to keep um, or, um, keep some of the elements of this model of co cross collaboration that's happening going forward so we can tackle um, health inequities going forward. And then my last piece, and, and we can follow up, I know there's sort of big questions too, it's just on the health navigators piece and multilingual mm -hmm. cultural competent folks. And that's my last question. Thank you. Yeah. Rita. Thank you, Councilor Bob. So, so, the, uh, so we, we have one idea that we're uh, considering that will be part of our. Um, uh, yes. Uh, so one idea, um, Jerry Thomas, who's by my side here, is, is reminding me that uh, you know we have that we we run the mayor's health line and uh, we have navigators in the sense of uh, people who can um, connect folks to to health insurance and other services, and those services can be done by phone. We speak six languages in that office and. Uh, um, and also people can come to 1010 and, and get those services. But, you know, the idea we have as part of our recovery planning uh, and going forward into the future is to figure out whether we can create this one-stop shops where people can go or call or connect online where uh, all those resources that we know people are going to need, you know, people with food insecurity, housing insecurity, economic insecurity can call uh, or lack of health insurance, for example, uh, can call or go, and, and, uh, and, and maybe these things can be uh, in neighborhoods, um, so we can, um, you know, implement that sort of that navigator type uh, concept. Thank you, Rita. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Aiden says thank you. <laughs> in his way. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Campbell and to Aiden. Um, all right. Uh, next up is Council President Janey. Councillor Janey. Hello. And Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Janey. How are you? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear you? Great. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Director Nieves. Um, 
this is helpful. I was not able to uh, participate in the working session, uh, Madam Chair, so for, forgive me for not having pre-sent questions. Is this the area where there are some of the, the grants uh, for uh, anti-violence and prevention? Are you talking about the, the NTTs? I don't know the acronym. The, the, the neighborhood trauma For violence prevention. Yes, we, we have a, a whole division of violence prevention. Yes. As part of our child and family yeah, and I'm happy again to follow up. If you have uh, any information now, that was that would be great. I'm, I'm wondering just on how these programs are evaluated, um, how much money they're getting, what their success rates are, what progress we're making, how we can ramp up and scale up anything that we really see that success, mm -hmm. um, and and certainly. Um, if there are areas where we're not seeing it, obviously redirect the resources. And so mm -hmm. just, I would be, I would appreciate any information uh, regarding this area. Sure. So we, we would be more than happy. We could set up a, a call so we can give you a full orientation on the, the whole portfolio of, uh, of our, our CAF Bureau that runs, you know, all the violence prevention work. Yeah. It's extensive and, you know, happy to, to schedule a call with you and, and, and also send you information. Tierney, our IDR person is taking notes and, and she will be happy to send you some stuff so you can read uh, ahead of time and then we'll be happy to set up a time to, uh, that would be uh, to bring you up to speed. I appreciate that. I really do indeed. I do indeed. Um, and uh, one of the areas of concern is, is around uh, trauma and just uh, the social, emotional wellness, um, certainly of all of our city employees and, and folks and our commissions and, and everything. But I, you know, I think particularly about our families and, and our children who experience this. And I think about them showing up to school. And one question I ask in budget hearings is, you know, around what kind of system can we build to ensure better wraparound services for children when they show up in schools um, and schools that may not, because our children go to so many different schools, they can live on one street where an incident happened, but show up to 10, 20 different schools, uh, which may or may not be aware of what uh, transpired. And so, you know, I wonder how we uh, set up a communication line and how we use technology to help uh, get the word out to, to any of the schools where children in a particular geographic area have experienced this so that they are, you know, better prepared. I know many of them have adopted, you know, trauma sensitive uh, learning and are, are trying their best to be trauma uh, informed and, and responsive, but I just wonder if there's a way to set up a communication system using technology to get the word out. And I see um, certainly the Public Health Commission is being, a, you know, critical to the success of something like this. And I wonder if you just had any initial thoughts on what we, what we currently do and how we might uh, ramp that up just to make sure we're not having children who, who fall through the, the cracks. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. The, the, you know, the, the challenge of, of having children who may be in a, in a neighborhood and go to another school completely different from where they live, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge. But uh, as far as the work we do, we, we run uh, six neighborhood uh, trauma teams in different parts of the, uh, the city. And part of the work they, they do has to do a lot with um, how to respond when there's uh, an incidence of violence uh, in a particular place. And uh, that includes not only that neighborhood in particular, but also if there's a school, which sometimes, unfortunately, we have, we've had uh, incidents of violence right outside of school uh, that has affected a, a student, for example. So part of the work they do is, um, is connect um, not only with the neighborhoods and residents in that area, but if there's a school in, uh, nearby, to also do our reach uh, through you know, materials that they can bring. Uh, we have mental health counselors and we have uh, different folks that, that do uh, um, outreach that uh, already do some of that work. Uh, of course, you know, you know, we can never do enough in that area. We, we also have um, school health-based clinics 
and we also have um, health uh, health education resource centers in other schools. Altogether, you know, I don't I don't have the number in front of me, but uh, I think we have school health based clinics in about four or five locations and uh, uh, health education resource centers mm -hmm. in about six or seven. And uh, in those in those particular uh, schools, we have uh, mental health counselors. Uh, that are embedded in 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 the um, in the school and connected with uh, uh, staff and, and faculty and medical personnel, and uh, they do health education, they do trauma informed um, um, work. They they talk about um, they do violence prevention workshops. They do a number of things um, to that is more about prevention, but it it also comes uh, obviously. Uh, it becomes very useful when whenever there's an incident that has affected that particular school community and and you know because we have resources there or sometimes can mobilize them to another school uh there's a source of support and source of information that that the schools you know can can count on but you know we have so many schools uh in the system and um that's an area that obviously uh it'd be great if we could expand at some point because yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate there's a lot of ground to cover I do. I appreciate that. And I appreciate uh, your work. And, I, and I've had the opportunity to go on the trauma walks. I, I appreciate your work. I see the gavel is up. I thank want you. to respect the time and the hour. Uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you to your team. Continue to be safe. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Madam President. Um, next up is Councillor Flaherty, and then it'll be Councillor Baker. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it's good to see everyone. Reader, uh, Obviously, thank you for your time and talents. Little did you know when you were hired in December that we were going to embark on uh, on uh, a COVID-19 mission, but we are so lucky to have you. Um, thank you. Uh, you're a standout in your field. And of course, I got to give a shout out to Chief Martinez. He's been awesome uh, on the phone with us every morning and uh, not quite sure uh, how much sleep either of you are getting, but uh, just want to let you know, we appreciate it uh, as members of our city council, but also uh, members of the public have all commented on uh, our response and it's being led by uh, public health professionals like yourself and the chief. And of course, uh, the opioid crisis is, is is not immune from any of this. And so Jen and her team and their world has changed significantly. So I uh, want to give a shout out to her as well. Um, hopefully what, what can come out of this so that if it, God forbid it ever boomerangs, and I've said this to the chief, um, we really all, and I've challenged my colleagues in their respective districts to try to get as many people if they can, their constituents on the healthcare rolls. Uh, it's reimbursable care, and that will go a long way in helping our hospitals and our health centers that we can get someone, uh, a primary care physician. And so whether it's the, when, we're doing the, uh, when we're doing the food distribution and or when we're getting to, at the testing sites, we really ought to have a third line engaging folks and getting them on the health care rolls. Uh, we, we would, we're going to miss a huge opportunity if we don't do that. And I go back to Councilor Kelly at the time, the late Jim Kelly and I, we got folks in our neighborhood to sign up through our local community health center. And I think it's paying dividends uh, in this COVID-19 response. A lot of folks in our public housing in particular did not have health care and we worked hard and got them on there. So uh, that's just my opine. Uh, I've also been a strong advocate over the years on, on oral health um, and uh, oral health, the barriers that our vulnerable and underserved populations face and also can lead to other major health issues. So if we're talking about um, you know, health care uh, and equity and we're talking about uh, disparity and ex pre-existing conditions, uh, you can trace a lot of it back to oral health. So I see that the budget here is uh, you know, 5.7 million. And I just want to get a sense as to how is COVID-19 impacting um, you know, this uh, office's work, uh, the, particularly the Office of Oral Health, given that a lot of folks can't see their dentist, dentists are arguably uh, shut down. And I'm concerned about the long-term impact that will have and then also after that, I want to shift gears to recovery okay. services and to thank them for the hard work that they're doing and uh, access to care. I, I know that the Section 35s have been working. They're in a new form, but I've been having some success with that. Um, but also, I want to continue to advocate that when we uh, administer Narcan, that arguably that should be some type of reporting event and or a transport to the hospital. There are a lot of folks that overdose in their own loved ones, their family members don't even know about the event uh, and or the ability to sort of jump in, in and try to get treatment. So I know that uh, when we give administer Narcan on the street, uh, the individual jumps up like Jack in the box in many, many instances just walks away and we're almost powerless. I, I would love to have a system where when we administer Narcan, it's a 
it's a mandatory transport uh, to the hospital and try to get our, uh, wrap ourselves around them for treatment and recovery. At the very least, let their loved ones know about the event so that you know they're on notice and they can do what they can as a family member. So uh, that's it for me in, in this round, uh, touch base on oral health and touch base on recovery. Thank you. So, uh, Councillor, the uh, oral, our, our oral health, I think the, the line that you're seeing in the budget, um, uh, I believe has to do with uh, the uh, oral health funding that comes through our Ryan White federal grant. And those are uh, subcontracts that we put out uh, into, into the community. Um, so uh, I, I'm looking at uh, Grace Connolly and see if she has any information about um, you know, or even, how, or even reader, reader, if I, reader, I could, reader, I could amend it just to say, you know, I guess what, what is, I guess, um, you know, I know there's a lot of community partners here, but uh, maybe I could ask a question on what's the overall budget for, for that office. I know that office of oral health, it looks like it's 5.7 community initiative bureau budget, but I guess I, I guess I, I'd like to oh, kind of yeah. lap back and find yeah. out what goes. Right. Sorry. We're just playing a little, um, around here. So we'll get you that budget for the Office of Oral Health. We actually have two programs. One is in the Ryan White program and the other is in the Community Initiatives Bureau. And we'll get that information out to you and make sure the distinction is made. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. And through the chair, if you could get that information to uh, Chairwoman Ball. Yes, absolutely. And then, and then Jen, maybe on the recovery, just as the NAR can in your opinion, I guess, or a public health's position on whether it should be a, a, a reporting event. Um, hi, thank you, Councillor. Um, just to address that, our post overdose response team um, who goes into homes oftentimes encounters family members, and that's been a very successful intervention, providing information and education. Um, right now, there's privacy laws uh, that sort of prohibit, are prohibiting us uh, for doing um, you know, uh, the, the notification, but I will say that I think we've been really successful with our team um, following up on overdoses and providing information and education, even during COVID-19, when we weren't doing face-to-face follow-ups, um, we, we put that on hold for COVID-19, but we continue to work with Boston Fire Department and our team here of public health advocates to um, go into neighborhoods, dropping information and education for individuals um, and their families. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Councillor Flaherty. Um, next up is Councillor Baker, and then it'll be Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Baker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just more want to say thank you to Rita, thank you to Jen, and thank you to um, Devin there. The work that's happened in the past, I've been on the council, I'm in my ninth year. The way we used to deal with homeless and the way we used to deal with people with, with substance abuse issues if we were still doing those things today, we would be far worse off. And, and the fact that we've had um, these numbers, so many, so many additional people on our streets and, and, with, and with much more complex issues that we're actually able to um, you know, make strides in, in, in what you guys are doing. So that's, that's um, you know, a great, a great thing you guys are doing. I just want to make sure that you, I said that to you because I remember the way we used to do it. The first thing that I filed as a city councilor was for a 311 line for us to be able to connect people on to um, help, whether if it was family members looking to get someone into a detox or any, anything along, along those lines. We've come so far and it's, and it's, and it's due to you guys. So thank you for that. Um, and I and I just can't stress enough the <clears throat> the importance of our next step, which is Long Island. And I, I don't have to say let's stay on top of it. Let's let's keep moving along because I know you guys are. I just think when we're able to get that Long Island campus open, we'll be able to really deliver long term care to people that need it. And and that's that's about it for me. Thank you guys for what you do. Rita, you've been along, you've been around a long time and, and you know, you've, you've just been great. So, so thank you all. 
And that's it for me. There. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor. Great. Thank you, Councilor Baker. Um, Rita, do you have any comments on that? Um, I'll actually, I'll let uh, Jen answer that because she's she's the lead for um, Long Island. And uh, Jen, you want to give her an update? I'm not sure what the question was. Um, Long Island, you know, yeah. I don't know. The on the yeah, progress. Just staying focused on, on, on Long Island. I know you want to focus maybe what's our, what's our next step? What, 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 what's our big next hurdle? So, uh, well, we're full steam ahead, as you know, um, our role in the planning, master planning process. We have not skipped a beat with COVID or not. We continue to meet at least once weekly, sometimes more than once weekly on a variety of level of teams to create the, the comprehensive uh, recovery campus, which includes different levels of care um, and services and wraparound services and uh, looking at um, the environment of the island, the building. So there's uh, several city teams actually that are working on the Long Island um, recovery campus um, in all aspects. So um, we're still at it and, and we're very hopeful that uh, we'll be able to move forward with you know, get to the next level and that at some point that the, the waivers um, and the process for the bridge will move forward and um, we'll be ready when that happens. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much, Councillor Baker. Um, next up is uh, Councillor Arroyo and then it'll be Councillor Mejia and then Councillor Flynn. Councillor Arroyo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you both Jen and Rita for your time, I recognize the hour. I think I'll be able to do this in one round. Um, and so I just wanna jump right in. Um, I appreciate the questions about trauma that uh, uh, Councilor and President Janey uh, brought up, uh, just specifically on uh, cultural competency when it comes to counseling, um, language access when it comes to trauma resources and, and, and all of those uh, important things. There's a there's a lot of trauma that I think feeds into a lot of the uh, inequities that we see. And so, in what ways does this budget serve to make uh, you know make trauma resources and, and counseling resources more accessible for communities of color and communities that speak languages other than English? Um, would be one question. Uh, second, uh, the second question I have is similar. Uh, how is the Boston Public Health Commission uh, supporting residents' mental health, which I know uh, Councillor Braden mentioned. So just it, specifically in this budget, how is that reflected? Um, third, uh, is there any part of this specific budget uh, that looks specifically at uh, ways in which we can address health inequities that are based on race and ethnicity? Uh, and then finally, uh, is there anything not funded, and this is for both uh, parties, is there anything not funded by this budget that you would like additional funding to do? So is there any program or specific area that you would like to see more funding um, than is currently allotted uh, in this budget? So that's, if there was anything you were gonna go to bat for, uh, what would it be? And that's for both of you. And, and with that, those are all my questions. Thank you both in advance. Thank you, uh, Councillor Arroyo. Um, so a couple of things about the cu culturally competent um, trauma-informed uh, work. So we, we have uh, a component within our Division of Violence that's called the um, Capacity Building Training Institute. And we have you know, um, dedicated um, group of trainers that work uh, very closely with community-based organizations uh, to equip them on how to do trauma-informed uh, training and provide trauma-informed care. So, um, you know, and, and these um, trainings are done in, in CBOs uh, in, that traditionally serve uh, communities of color and that have um, um, language uh, capacity uh, to, to serve, um, you know, folks that are, are non-English uh, speakers. So, that's one of the things that, that we do uh, to increase capacity and invest in the capacity uh, of our communities and community-based organizations to be able to, to de deliver that kind of uh, culturally competent uh, 
training and support uh, to our communities. Um, our budget, uh, in terms of health equity, it, um, it funds um, our whole uh, health equity component. Um, you probably know that you know, we've had a, a health equity office for um, over 12 years, and uh, many of the work uh, that we have done uh, have been to, to really build internal capacity within the Boston Public Health Commission so we can ensure that um, all the work that our programs do and our, all the services that we deliver are done um, using a, a health equity approach. In the last you know, um, uh, year, we developed a community engagement plan that um, it's meant to um, really uh, ensure that all of our programs and all services um, you know, it creates that expectation that for any of us to do anything, whether it's a, a brand or uh, create a new program, we need to make sure that the right community engagement um, has happened and that we build uh, systems to bring to the table residents that will be the recipient of the services that we're going to provide. So um, we also have done some, um, you know, the health equity uh, office has just created uh, what we call the health equity champions. And through that, um, which, which, you know, uh, it's an advisory group that we, we uh, created. Uh, this is the second round of uh, health equity champions that we recruit their community folks that, you know, from uh, different socioeconomic, racial, ethnic backgrounds. And uh, this is the group that our board of health and, and some of our other programs consult around programming and anything that we have to do that we wanna make sure that that has community and consumer voice uh, and input. So our budget, uh, the, the thing that you will find in our budget that's distinctly about health equity is funding all the health equity um, efforts that happen during that within you know, the, the health equity uh, um, uh, office. And uh, what's not funded, uh, this is in, in general terms, I imagine, the question. Um, I think, you know, we, um, we were able to get uh, most of our um, uh, new investments uh, covered uh, in the budget that we submitted. Uh, we got some, some dollars to support our, C, our Capacity Building Training Institute and some of our infrastructure under violence prevention. And we also got, um, uh, you know, recovery got some funding to do a, a respite uh, housing study. And we also got money uh, that was very important for us to really increase our capacity to have a more robust uh, data collection that informs um, our health of Boston data. So we got money to, to be able to expand our sample and, and then be able to um, do some additional uh, data data analysis and go into uh, subgroups that we traditionally are not able to do. So um, I think you know the, the budget. Uh, you know we, we were able to get the, the initiatives funded that were um, our priority, and uh, and we feel we feel fine about the budget. I, I talked earlier. I don't know if you heard that for all the other COVID nineteen expenses that we expect going forward. Um, we're relying on the CARES Act uh, funding, federal funding, to be able to help us um, assume all that cost. And you know, uh, the mayor, you know, has been great at uh, supporting, you know, everything that we've done, and and uh, we're very grateful for his support and, and really giving us the resources that that we need to to assume the FY21 um, scope of work. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, to answer that for us, um, I would also just, um, as you know, we, we showed the graph of the increase in our budget every year since um, the Office of Recovery Services was created. And so we're very grateful to the Mayor uh, and the City Council for that. Um, and also one of our goals for FY21 being um, increasing harm reduction services um, throughout the city. And so really working with community, nonprofit community providers to scale up their capacity to work with people with substance use disorders. Um, that wouldn't affect our budget, but I think that um, 
that's uh, an area that we are hoping to do more in next year. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jen, and thank you, Councillor Arroyo. Um, next up is Councillor Mejia, then it'll be Councillor Flynn. Um, and I'll just note for colleagues that we will do a second round of questions, but I'll ask anybody who has a second set of questions to raise their blue hand, because um, we'll just do them optionally. So um, Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Yes, hi, good evening uh, again to um, Councillor Bach for the long day today. I really do appreciate how you have tortured us all day today. And to my colleagues um, in the public, um, Boston Public Health Commission, uh, Chief Martinez and your whole entire team and Commissioner Nieves, really excited um, to have the opportunity to build alongside you. I do have a lot of questions and um, I'm gonna say them all and then maybe you can get through as much as you can and then we can pick up in round two if we need to, okay? I, um, I actually I only have five. My questions are specifically um, for the first round, one of the uh, BPH's goals is to make the department a model for racial um, equity. I'd love to know what your strategy is to go about that. What opportunities are there to um, involve the voices of the people in the process and how can the city council be a part of that process as well? I'm curious about the youth development program that is led by the Boston Public Health Commission. It's the program that works with students who are chronically absent. I think it's a great model. I know that you are in Charlestown, um, the Burke, Madison Park, um, in Brighton and schools that are, are in need. I'm just curious what if any opportunities exist to expand that model to middle schools because what I'm, I'm hearing and seeing is that kids in, in the lower grades are also experiencing some, some need for targeted interventions. Um, I'm curious uh, in terms of cultural competency, you know, I think when we first started talking about social distancing, it felt like a foreign concept. I just, you know, one thing is translation. I just think it's really important for us to think about how are we being culturally competent with even the information that we're sharing with folks so that it's a little bit more um, easier for us to understand um, some of these concepts that were coming out as of COVID. I'm also curious about the next domestic violence um, at midst of, you know, of this crisis. As you know, there's been an uptick. Just curious about how we're responding to that as a city, as well as I'm also curious about STDs. I, I believe you know people are, are engaging in higher risk behavior. So just kind of what, what is the game plan around helping to reduce the spread of um, sexually transmitted diseases? And then for ORS, I'm just curious in terms of, um, are the Narcan trainings um, offered in multiple languages? If so, which languages are they? Coming the fact that summer, we'll see that it's the highest season for administering Narcan and given the impacts of COVID-19 and the rate of overdoses during the summer, just what plans are in place to uh, uh, address these issues and what can we do to improve upon the syringe uh, return rate? Thank you so much. So, Councillor, uh, on the question of um, health equity and uh, community engagement, and community uh, creating opportunities for community uh, voice and also council council voices. Um, you know, I was mentioning before when I was uh, answering uh, Councillor Arroyo's uh, question that. You know, we've had uh, a health equity office that, you know, it's, it's more than 12 years old. And uh, uh, for many years, we've worked to increase our ability to connect uh, and engage community residents in providing feedback, input, and, uh, and also to, to make sure that um, we, we gain their voice uh, in informing our programming. So we've, there are a couple of things that are going on. Um, for many years now, actually, uh, the, the commission, um, it's usually in, in the summer, it starts in May, it ends like in September, we've held uh, community meetings in all the years because we've done it for so many, so many years. Um, we, we've, we've used different methods, you know, we've, there was a year, for example, that we went to each single neighborhood. Uh, as you can imagine, that's a lot of uh, work uh, and planning to, to be able to pull that off. We've had uh, occasions in which we uh, select some neighborhoods in particular and then rotate throughout the years. And we've also had years in which we have uh, themes. Um, for example, about two, three years ago, we had a, um, the theme of uh, trauma. 
I'm sorry, Commissioner. Um, just because my time is so limited and then I, I asked like 101 questions. I'm glad to hear that you guys are doing your dual diligence on the outreach. So thank you for that. I'd love to just spend the rest of the little bit of time that I have left on some of my other questions, if you don't mind. Okay. So um, tell me, tell I'm, me uh, about the youth development, the youth development. I'm just curious as to whether or not um, that program, I know it really well. I'm just curious as to whether or not there's been any discussions around um, expanding it to middle schools just because for targeted interventions, yes or no would be fine. So how about, I'll get back to you because I, I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to consult okay. with the program folks. And, and, and then, then that's just, yeah. okay, perfect. And then if you could tell me a little bit about kind of what are we doing around cultural competency? One thing is just to be able to translate, but just kind of like, where are you getting some advice around cultural competency language that people can understand and in the hood more specifically? Yeah, no, you know, that's a, that's a great point. And, and you're right, you know, this messaging around social distancing, um, uh, I think it's, it's been hard to, to uh, share with folks you know, with especially um, people who, who are from other cultures in the, the concept of not hugging or shaking hands or kissing, it's, it's, uh, it's from like another planet. So I think um, we, we need, we, even though we've tried to, um, you know, keep in mind, you know, how, what, what are the best ways for us to message, you know, making yeah. sure that we, uh, keep in mind, you know, people's culture, different cultures and language. I think this is an area that we need to keep uh, improving. And, uh, you know, we put stuff out there, you know, our staff are all, um, you know, culturally diverse, but uh, that doesn't mean, you know, that, that it's not an area that we need to improve. And um, we, we're going to have a chance, you know, in the uh, upcoming months, messaging is not over. We need to continue to uh, uh, share the same messages around precautions and also other messages that we'll have to put out. So this is an opportunity for us to to hopefully get it right and, and, and do Thank a better you. job. Of that. Thank you. And I'm just I see that I see that gavel. I'm telling you, this, I'm going to need therapy after I get done with you, Buck, with all this gaveling. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I get my other questions in here. I'm just curious about domestic violence, the uptick on that, and you know, I'm going to assume that you all are doing something around that. You could just we, yeah. we have a family justice center, and on where that's a collaborative of twenty, the twelve uh, community-based uh, organizations. Uh, that they all do something different around domestic, uh, whether it's domestic violence, child abuse. So they're working uh, virtually and providing services by phone, Skype, uh, you know, doing st stuff virtually and, and continue to provide the services that they do. Yeah. And, and, violence. and my time is up. So I'm going to assume that the uh, recovery will be the next time around. Commissioner Nieves, I would love an invitation to meet with you and to figure out how our office can be a partner um with this That's work great. I, I started off my career in public health and i'm to be committed to this conversation happy to have you over and, and give you uh, an orientation about everything else we do thank you thank you great thank you so much councillor mejia and uh proud to have the family justice center in my district um thank you for all your work on that uh councillor ed flynn councillor flynn you have the floor thank you thank you councillor block and um Thank you to the dedicated and professional uh, public health commission staff. Thank you, Reader, and for all your hard work, and to to Jen and the other the others that are that are here. Um, I don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you for the tremendous work you're doing across the neighborhoods of Boston. I worked um, I worked with Councilor Campbell on domestic violence and with the public health team. I worked with Jen on uh, recovery outreach and with with reader and Marty Martinez on language access and um, making sure that you know we do all we can in the Asian community as well um, mm -hmm. so I just want to say thank you to reader and to Jen and the entire public health team that are really the unsung heroes in our city you do a lot of tremendous work and I just want to say thank you on behalf of uh, my my constituents in district two thank you Councilor. thank you that, that's all I have, Council Block. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Block, it uh, looks like she may have stepped away for a moment. Following uh, Councilor 
Flynn, uh, would be <laughs> Councillor Bach. Madam <laughs> Chair, the floor is yours. Sorry, my computer, uh, my internet cut out, which is not-, not That's what I'm here for. That's what I'm here for, Madam Chair. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna slide my questions in and then we will go back up to the top to you, Councillor Safi George. Thanks so much for jumping in. Um, uh, Rita, I, I had a few budget related questions so um, that I sent ahead. So one was just about, you know, I know there were some salary savings related to employment attrition and um, and some increased overtime expenses. And I just I wonder, I know that there are certainly, you know, a few months here where it was quite hard to hire people, but also that you guys have been, you know, accelerating trying to hire people. So I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit and sort of how much success you've had lately and staffing up and what's the plan for kind of getting fully staffed up and reducing those overtimes and also just having the people you need to, to fight this situation. So we, um, we continue to, you know, uh, spend a lot of time doing recruitment. One of the things that we were able to do was um, we were able to post a number of um, what we call feeling counselors. This is mostly around our homeless services and recovery uh, uh, sites and you know Jen can speak to that um, and uh, one of the things that we did early in the uh, pandemic was to upgrade those uh, feeling counselors upgrade the salary so we could really attract some more folks and 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 that seemed to, to work um, but you know I think what one of the things that has created um, some of the overtime costs has to do with um, you know our folks are in the front line it doesn't get you know more of uh, up close than that. And as a result, you know, we've had uh, people get sick uh, and be out, or, you know, we've had folks that, you know, they have underlying conditions and that have been able, that, that have needed to, to leave uh, obviously uh, their post uh, because of that. So, um, but, you know, sick, you know, sick calls and stuff like that. So has generated some of that overtime uh, that, that we've had to pay folks to be able to have adequate uh, staffing. But we continue to um, to recruit uh, the best we can, and, and like I said, you know, the feeling counselors and increasing the uh, salary, uh, the hourly salary, you know, uh, helped. And uh, this is an ongoing thing. You know, we we always have uh, challenges. You know, finding folks that want to work in, in the front line. So um, I don't know if it's Grace, you need to you want to add anything about the money. Grace, hi. I think there are just some routine overtime costs. You know, our property management department, if the fire alarm goes off in the middle of the night, they respond. They're also, um, as part of um, MassPass 2.0, they're cleaning on the weekends. They work all week. And then there are a couple overtime shifts to help clean up the needles and the trash that accumulates. And then our public safety department also, if there are emergencies, um, they respond. Homeless services, we get call out. So, there's always going to be some overtime, but you're right. It was really tough at the beginning of the year to hire people. And I think, you know, one of the things that will come of this, it may be a little easier, which is really unfortunate if we look at the big picture, but it was super difficult at the beginning to hire people. And I think we're going to see that change now and we should reduce the overtime expenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and it certainly, I mean, it certainly seems to me, I mean, in this country, I would say we've, you know, massively underinvested in our public health infrastructure. And so I think, and that also is about salaries, right? And it's about, yeah. and so I just think that, you know, in it, we can wave our arms at that at the national level, but it's incumbent upon us in Boston to make sure that we're not participating in that. And I think we're as, we're, you know, we are as much part of that as everybody really. Um, yeah. And I guess to that point, I'm wondering, I think our, I think our director of the Bureau of Infectious Diseases spot is still vacant. Is that right? That's um, right. And I wonder what the, obviously, um, I mean, you know, it's bad luck that that was vacant at the time that this, that this mm -hmm. launched. And, but I think as a, as a number of people have said, this is going to be with us for a while. Yes. Um, and it seems to me like we would want to be really looking for a very talented capable person and offering the a suitable salary, et cetera, in order to make that happen as we think about a couple of years ahead, because it would be great to add that capacity, never mind you know, for the next one. So I just wonder where we are on that search and that process. We're actively searching. Uh, salary should not be an issue because you know I think we have a, a competitive salary. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that that um, may may be an issue at some point with some candidates, it has to do with residency requirements. 
Um, and uh, but we we're actively looking. You know, we're doing some interviews. Um, we're actually doing an interview uh, next week, I believe. And um, you know, we've been fortunate to have you know Dr. Jen Love, who's our medical director, who has really uh, played the role of also acting uh, infectious disease bureau director. And uh, we have the associate bureau director Tom Lane, who's done a, a fantastic job and, and helped us, uh, you know, uh, in this response. And we've also had the uh, the, the great benefit since last July, actually, uh, of having Dr. Alde Maria, who used to be the uh, state of epidemiologist who's an infectious disease uh, specialist, and you know, over 30 years of experience, he worked for the state, and that's what he did. Um, so he's our consultant and he's a phone call away and he's been uh, providing support to Dr. Jendo and our infectious disease bureau team every step of the way. So um, we, yeah, it was unfortunate that, that it was vacant, but we, we had an infrastructure and we had a system in place on how to get the, uh, the uh, infectious disease expertise that we needed. And, and you know, Dr. De Maria, you know, is playing that role until we can, you know, find, find uh, a permanent person. Yeah, got it. But we're in good um, hands. Yeah, we're no, really everybody, good hands. everybody stepped up and it's been great. I just think, I mean, the 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 line that keeps like, you know, resonating in my head through this is, you know, the cavalry is not coming. Like we are, right? Like no one, like if someone's going to solve contact tracing at scale, it's going to be here in Massachusetts. It's going to be here, right? Like there's a decent chance that like one of our folks in Boston will find the vaccine. Like work we're kind of it, right? And unfortunately, I wish that weren't true vis-a-vis -vis our federal government, but it just seems to me like that's gonna be a long enough campaign that we want somebody really talented in that role to augment our current strong team. And and I, I, I would just sort of say that, you know, if what it takes to have someone talented in that role is a transitional housing allowance or like something that lets them, you know, settle in the city, like I, I think we should be looking at all options. Cause- Yeah, no, yeah, uh, yeah no, uh, if, if when we find somebody and if that's an issue, we will definitely uh, look at all the options and you know advocate for whatever needs to happen so we can really secure the, the most competent person and experienced person we could possibly get. So that's we, great to hear. On it. Great. All right, that's my time for the first round. So we're gonna go back up to the top. Um, Councillor Asabi George. And I'll just remind others that if you have a second round of questions, I would just ask you to raise your blue hand. Um, Councillor Asabi George. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you again for sticking it out with us for such a long day. Um, I do have a couple of questions, so I'll go until I get stopped. Um, one, we had a conversation earlier today with public safety, uh, Boston Police, Boston Fire, Boston EMS, and one of the questions I had asked um, in the police section with the commissioner was around response times to the seaport area. And I failed to ask uh, Chief um, Hooley about this. And I'm not sure if perhaps you could answer the question because of the, the connection between the Health Commission's budget and uh, EMS's budget. But there was a capital project at one point at the seaport, um, I think regarding uh, ambulance bay. I don't know if Grace is available to answer those questions. I miss seeing Grace in the chamber, if I could just actually say that out loud. Well, I'll, I'll make sure she says hello now and I have something better than Grace. <laughs> So Grace, Grace, no, no offense. I have Chief Hooley sitting right here. Oh, perfect, perfect. So he can come and, uh, and answer the yeah, okay. questions. Perfect. But so one of the one of the concerns is um, this sort of part of the city, the South Boston waterfront, uh, the seaport area. There is some issues around um, jurisdiction when it comes to police, but we also recognize because of traffic and sort of the way that it's situated and the way that it was laid out that there's a lack of access for our first responders. So it came up in police. It was something that I think one of my colleagues brought up in fire um, and I failed to bring it up in EMS, but it's related to a capital project. So if someone could answer that. Um, and then the second part of that question, Rita, I'm sorry, before you get up because they may be, they are related and it is a question that I started with the chief uh, because of the relationship with the with EMS to the health commission, as opposed to it being, and I think it should be, the third leg on the stool as part of our public safety uh, departments. The uh, budget isn't itemized for EMS through the health commission. It is sort of a single line with a dollar amount. Um, I'm curious why that is and whether we could get a deeper breakdown um, other than at some yeah. point other than the presentation that the chief 
um, gave earlier today. Whoever can answer that question, whether it's the chief or Grace, uh, that would no, be great. Yeah, uh, it's an easy answer. You, uh, you can have the detailed uh, budget. I don't know how, why it went out that way, but you can have the detailed budget for EMS. No problem. We'll, we'll get it to great. you. Thank you, but I'm not going to um, get to see Grace. Yes, here. Hi, Tom. Hi. Uh, how are you? Good, Good how are you? you. <laughs> I saw you on CNN last night. You were great with the mask. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, she is just uh, bursting uh, out of uh, enjoyment because he needs to, he, he gets to talk about the key part now. Trying to keep the uh, proper uh, distances in here. Anyway. I don't mean to bring you back in, Chief, after the marathon that you uh, ran this afternoon with us, but um, I am curious about the capital project in the seaport and with Grace there, perhaps you could um, just give us an update on that project um, as well. And then I'm all. No, okay. Um, it's still, the, uh, the, I believe it was 375,000, It's still, uh, I heard it in the document. Three seventy five. Uh, thousand still uh, in the capital budget. It's been there for two two years now. This will be like the third year of this year. So they were looking for siding uh, down in there, and uh, there was a couple of different ideas for years ago. They were talking about building something down the end of uh, down where the relief boats used to be. Then they were talking about building something over by the uh, reserve channel down where the uh, trailer is for the housing unit now, and then. Uh, they kind of hung out there for a while. Then they were talking about putting us in the uh, first floor of 22 Dry Dock Ave, down with the uh, BPDA. Yeah, yeah. Now there's some talk about that going away. Um, so last year, they approached us, Capitol Day. Great. Said, Small parcel on Dry Dock Ave. The number escapes me right now. It's farther up Dry Dock Ave, going down towards. OK, I'm, I'm actually, I actually am not. It, it, well, but anyway, the location they, they, would be great. Site. I just want to know that it's happening and we're well, yeah, it's, still, it's not it's not gone. What they what they looked at was they said the possible that is city owned, which is great. They thought that perhaps it was not large enough or sufficient to build on. And I so I asked them, could you look at maybe doing a like a garage below and quarters above here? Yeah, try to get creative and do it. And they said that they would, and I just haven't heard back yet. I think that, okay, so I, I mean, I think there's a there's an interest by the council, at least a few of us, to move on that because we recognize that as a real uh, a gap in service. We've we've allotted it through capital, and we yeah, I'd like to see some movement um, movement on that effort. Uh, thank you very much for that. And then also as it relates to uh, capital, Jen, I know you are there, and uh, Devin too. It, it, there isn't a question here, just a statement because I know Councillor Baker brought it up. The capital investment um, for Long Island, you know, want to want to help advocate however I can. I understand and appreciate that your efforts have continued on that part, um, and just I want to applaud that persistence and that continued commitment to it because it's it's a great deal of work. Uh, and then last for me, um, maybe Chief Huli Rita could come back. Um, this might be a, this may be a, a more appropriate question for her, um, or for something that I'd like make sure that she uh, hears is. I would like um, just to, to understand what it might mean to increase the mobile sharps team. I think that we continue to see improperly discarded needles across our city. We know that we're uh, collecting back um, over more than one to one on what we're putting out. Um, so if, if there needs to be some sort of advocacy around investing, increasing an investment in that mobile sharps team, because I do know for sure, because uh, I've spent time with them. I spent time in particular with Sarah Mackin, who does really, um, she's an angel uh, in the effort um, that she puts out in, in assisting individuals uh, that are really dealing with or in the midst of a crisis and giving her and her team the resources they need to not just do simply do the pickup, but to do the outreach piece too. I, you know, I want to be able to advocate for whatever you need in that place as space. And then lastly, I know that most of your work is around the, um, you know, supporting individuals who have, uh, who are experiencing homelessness. 
in the mayor's budget through DND, there's an, uh, an allotment for an advisor on family homelessness. I've done um, a lot of work around advocating for the creation of a commission to end family homelessness in the city of Boston. So just, I, I, I remind you, I know that you know that this work is happening. I remind you because I think that the health commission and the office of recovery services certainly would play a role uh, in that effort and that, um, that work. So just sort of putting it out there for, the, for all of you uh, do really understand and appreciate the amount of work that you are undertaking every single day, add on top to it, uh, layer on top a, a pandemic, a global pandemic that we really have been um, center to in the Northeast. Um, so just, you know, and, and your work obviously continues. A lot of us are able to do these meetings and Zoom talks from home and other places. You are obviously in the office and I know you are every day doing this work. So thank you. That is my cue, Madam Chair. I am. I think I'm done with questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Savi George. Um, and uh, um, Council President Janey, did you wanna just, I'm I, I know you don't, it's, we're gonna... coming, we're coming to you, Councillor Mejia, one second. Councillor right. Janey doesn't have any questions. She just wanted to say good night. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to the team. I had to uh, rush back. Um, I would affirm what Councilor Sabi George said around uh, any needed investment around the mobile sharps, but just wanted to say thank you uh, for everything. Great. Thank you so much, Madam President. All right, now Councilor Mejia. I, so I, I, I had a, a technical glitch here. I, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't bust your eardrums. Um, and so just curious, I, I didn't get uh, um, some of my questions in regards to um, the Office of Recovery Services. I just wanted to pick back up on the Narcan training, whether or not it's done in multiple languages. And I'm just also curious about kind of the, the rates of overdose during the summer. What if any plans are being in place now, look, you know, knowing that COVID-19 is just gonna make it a lot harder for us for physical um, contact. So just curious about what that plan looks like. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, so overdose prevention training, we have, um, so pre-COVID, we do in-person and drop-in. Uh, we have uh, weekly uh, drop-in sessions here, and then we also go out uh, into the community. We also have online training that is accessible in Spanish and English. Um, so the in-person trainings are Spanish and English, and the online trainings um, are also in Spanish and English. Yeah, other languages, just besides. Um, right now, no. Right now, just Spanish and English. Okay. Um, would you do you ever see a need to expand it to other languages like Haitian Creole and Mandarin? Is is there a need? Is a budget reason? Would you be able to if you had the resources to be able to provide it in different languages? I think we're always looking to increase access to all communities mm -hmm. online. And. Mm -hmm. and um, did that answer that question? Yeah. And then um, asked around um, syringe return, um, how to increase oh, no. syringe return. Yeah, I mean, I'm just curious about, um, you know, in the whole uh, state of physical distancing, just wondering what uh, Narcan and, you know, overdoses, what's that, what's the plan going to look like for the summer? I'm just curious. How are you guys dealing with that? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm going to um, let Devin answer that. Um, well, we're still pushing out Narcan into all communities just as we usually do, and our street teams are well equipped to uh, respond to overdoses um, and administer Narcan. We have instituted additional policies around PPE um, and response for our on street teams, which includes the use of single use of ampu bags, additional training, um, and putting on PP, like full PPE before doing overdose response. Uh, we received guidance from our infectious disease team, from EMS, and from Boston Health for the Homeless, and we're still fine-tuning those protocols as we kind of go into summer and find more people on the street and increase our response. Uh, but right now, I feel like we're very well uh, equipped and supported by all of our partners, and, you know, so far, so good. That's great. That's great. I'm happy to hear that. I'm also curious um, in, in terms of just a lot of the stigma that when we talk about um, issues of, of substance use disorder, there's a lot of stigma. Um, and I'm just wondering what, if any, 
support or um, outreach or anything that you all are thinking around helping to remove the stigma around um, issues of, of substance uh, disorder? I think um, increasing communication in all communities, um, because obviously the, the issue of stigma, stigma plays a, a different role in different communities, and it's a really important piece of the work. Um, we have we do coalition work in certain neighborhoods, and that uh, is a goal to increase sort of our coalitions across neighborhoods to bring people together to have those conversations, which is really important. And, the more information people have and the more opportunity and safe space they have to, to kind of share their concerns and not be judged by that yeah. um, is really important. Yeah. Are you seeing um, any correlation between the uptick in, in substance use and STDs? I mean, I mean, I know they're two different departments, if you will, Brad Cohen, I think mm -hmm. that's all stuff with sexual health, but I'm just curious what, if any, is there an intersection between these two and um, how are you all are dealing with it as a, as a commission? Rita, is that question got you crazy? That's why you're doing this? <laughs> oh, no, I, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking to... to now, whoever can answer, I'm just curious about like, when we're, I'm looking at the correlation between um, substance use and STIs. It seems like yeah. those two things are usually interconnected and I'm just wondering... What, of what course, there are. And I'll, I, I can start, and, and Jen, you can talk more in detail about the work you've been doing around HIV prevention. But you know, HIV is a good example, right? Of um, you know, our numbers ha have been going down. You know, between I think it was like 2008 and 2015, they went down for uh, about 25 percent. And then in in 2008, we had a, a cluster of HIV moving, HIV infections among uh, people who inject drugs in Lawrence, mm -hmm. Lowell, and then it moved to Boston. And um, we've had two uh, occasions uh, last year in which we had clusters of new HIV cases, to totally totally prevent preventable, but they're all associated about you know uh, drug use and, and you know sexual health, sexual risky sexual uh, behavior, and how those two things you know you put them together, and then people yeah. obviously. Yeah make uh, uh, are not able to make good decisions for themselves and then we end up then having to deal right. with uh, HIV cases that, right. that we should be having to have and you know Jen and, and Devin can speak about all the things that they did to to try to uh, make accessible you know street outreach pre, you know uh, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis post-exposure prophylaxis and really work with our clinical partners to make sure people had access to all those services. So again, I don't know if you want to add. Yeah. Well, I see the gavel, and I, and I don't. I, I don't know if Jen is going to have enough time to to add. But I do appreciate some of the high level um, comments that you made in terms of some of the things that you're doing. Just one last question. This is really more about um, procurement and um, contracting opportunities, if any exist, to support minority business businesses um, in, in this process. Just curious about what the commission is doing to help yeah. that. I'm gonna let Grace answer that because she she's done a great job with that. Hi, counselor. Hi, how are you? I'm well, and you? Good, good. I see Kenzie's gonna gavel you in a minute, so hurry up. <laughs> okay, I'll be really quick. So just um, over this past year, we did a new equitable procurement policy and actually through the COVID response, we've been increasing our vendors. Okay. So just some quick data. Um, we've increased by eight minority vendors, four women vendors. We also added LGBT and veteran vendors. Good. The one area we haven't had success is looking for vendors who have a disability. So we're going to really focus on that. Um, overall, we have a 5% increase in our contracting um, with our vendors. We're actually calling them CUBE, Certified Underrepresented Business Enterprises. So we are um, really striving to make changes here. And we have um, have a big contract with the veteran-owned business to actually provide PPE. That's great. So we're doing a lot of business with them right now. I'm, I'm happy to do that, Grace. I'm going to have um, Neil make sure that he puts me in touch with you too, OK? OK. Neil, you know, take those notes, Neil. Put me in touch with Grace. I got it. Thank you, Kenzie. I'll let you be, Kenzie. Go, go, go. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, Councillor Mejia. Um, 
you know, you know, it's been a been a long day of uh, budget hearings when you can get Neil to unmute in session. Um, uh, okay, I think uh, it's just me, and then um, and then we'll be uh, wrapping up. So I will just and I'll be brief. Um, I I do want to just say I think the I, I had the opportunity to do one of the A Hope Narcan trainings. I witnessed an overdose um, in last May, and I went to the June training and. It was really great and uh, it's enabled me to carry around Narcan ever since. And I just, I really appreciate that work that you all do. Um, and it was a, it was an amazing cross section of people who were taking the training. I think, you know, it's, it's just a, it's really a great service. So I'm glad we're finding ways to still have that program, even in COVID, COVID times, although I know it's had to adjust. Um, I just had a couple more budget questions. Sorry. Um, but I, uh, one is just, I, I did see that, and I think this might be related to something that you said earlier, but um, you know, the number of our folks on administrative and unpaid leave increased sharply from 64 to 125, which is about a 10th of the FTEs in the department. So I was just wondering if I couldn't tell if those numbers were pre COVID or if they reflected an uh, immediate post COVID trend. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Grace, uh, yeah, we have the answer. There, there's, we can clarify that for you. So in the data, one of the things that happened this year with COVID is that we were putting some folks on admin leave because they were um, exposed and we didn't have any way to do that before we issued the temp sick policy. So when we actually factor that out, the unpaid leave is 43 individuals. Those are the folks on admin leave. So it's actually consistent with last year. Got it. So it's all COVID. Um, yes. and, um, and then I guess my other question is, um, my sort of structural budget question is, so you, you've referred, Rita, to the fact that we're counting on the feds to come through with the money, and they and we have, right, some of the money that we're planning on, on using for reimbursement, the council's already approved the $120 million from the CARES Act. Um, but I still find myself wondering how we feel like we might need to change our, our public health infrastructure, like the sort of city operating budget side stuff. Um, just based on things that we've learned from this, also ways in which we know we're gonna to have to support that COVID work that won't be reimbursable. Um, and, and in that sense, it gives me a little bit of pause to be talking about a, a pre-COVID budget, like a budget that was really written for the most part before we knew the situation we were in, although there were some last minute adjustments. Um, and especially because, well, I know that the BPHC budget is going up this year more than other department budgets in the city, I also know that once you factor in the fact that BPHC carries its pensions and healthcare, that's not as much of a, that's not really that much of an increase over the baseline that other departments have because I mean, the BPHC is going up like 10%, but pensions and such have gone up like 9%. And we see that where it's broken out in the rest of our budget. Um, so, so I just, I, I'm, I'm just wondering about what the conversations have been about what we need to do structurally um, to support that sort of FEMA eligible CARES Act eligible work on our side. So we're working on the FEMA reimbursement and you know, FEMA's at a 75% payout. We're hoping they'll go up to 90 or even hundred. So we're just starting to put that together. And then thinking about structural budget changes, we've started conversations about that. Um, it's, it's, we've been really busy just responding. So we haven't had a lot of time to dig into that. Um, and the budget increase, it was, it was salary saving. It was salary increases for the most part. And most of that was actually EMS with the BPPA unit. Mm -hmm. So you're right, it wasn't a lot to add additional programming, um, but there's a lot more to come to think about how we're doing the budgeting and just being prepared for these events in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thanks so much for that. Um, I think, those are all my questions, and I'm very conscious of the uh, extraordinarily late hour, especially given when we thought we would be starting this. So um, I, if all my colleagues are all set, Councillor Asabi George, I see you all set. <laughs> um, okay. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, uh, then it just, I just want to turn to you. I do have, I do have four people, um, in the, in the attendee box and they may just be watching, but I want to make sure. So, um, John Simmons, Derek and Dr. Sandra Mangual, if any of you are here to, to submit, to testify publicly, if you could just raise your blue hands. 
or indicate in the chat so that I can so that I can admit you. I will hang on, hang, hang tight for one second. All right, I understand Derek is is uh, BPHC, so he's not going to publicly testify. Um, all right, one more time, Dr. Mangual, Simmons, and John. All right, seeing none. I think I think it's uh, time to thank you, Rita, and uh, and your whole team, and also um, probably the MVP of the day, Chief Hooley, for reappearing. That's right. yeah. <laughs> Special uh, guest, special <laughs> appearance by Chief Cooley. Indeed, indeed. I would like to. It, it is. It has now been nine hours and fifteen minutes since we began this. Um, this. Um, and thank you, you Councillor Bog, for putting up with such a long day, and no, all no. the other councillors that were, you know, have been uh, on the call all day too. So appreciate your support and everything you do to make our 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 job easier. You know, throughout the year and. Those of you that, that we haven't met, uh, love to love to be able to change that in the uh, next month. Yes, looking forward to that. All right, well, with that, this meeting of the Boston City Council's Ways and Means Committee is adjourned. Um, thank you all. Yeah. Bye, thank everybody. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Thank you. Bye. You, you all need better masks. <laughs> <laughs>